at the beginning then. So my, my kind of first uh, question is, what is addiction? Uh, how do we define or think about addiction? And I have a couple of different definitions. The first one I call a narrow definition, and it's from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And it defines addiction the following way. It says, addiction is a treatable, chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. So I think that's a more narrow definition because it ties addiction to specifically to substances or to behavioral or process addictions, which are like gambling or um, gaming or those kinds of things. A broader definition, like the kind that you get in from Gerald May in his book, Addiction and Grace, is addiction is any compulsive habitual behavior that limits the freedom of human desire. Um, so, so basically kind of un, any sort of unhealthy attachment that might exist um, in a person's life. Now, it seems to me based on both of those definitions that a definition of compulsion is in order since they have it in both of them. And, um, compulsion is defined as the sense of being forced to do something against one's will. And so that becomes a more difficult concept, especially when we're talking about internal compulsion. Because that means you're being forced to do something against your will by something within yourself or something that's alongside or attached to your will in some way. And so, so there's some, some complexity involved in that. So I'll come back to those, addic those definitions um, a little bit later and say, um, I mean, I think they're both helpful. I don't know that there's one kind of comprehensive definition, but I think they're a helpful starting point. Another way of thinking about it is characteristics of addiction. Um, and you'll probably have heard these before, but one is, I mean, there's a lot of different lists that list different numbers of characteristics, but you'll usually find something about withdrawal, you know, so when you cease the substance or the behavior, there's withdrawal symptoms or tolerance, meaning that you constantly need more and more of the same substance or behavior, or kind of behavior to reach the same effect. Um, most of the thinkers I've read, well, it kind of depends, but most of, most of them don't associate withdrawal and tolerance um, as, well, wouldn't say that the presence of withdrawal and tolerance means that a person's experiencing major addiction, you know, um, because if I stopped drinking my coffee, I'd have withdrawal, and but that wouldn't necessarily go into the category of uh, major addiction. The features of major addiction, at least according to Dunnington and others, um, in their view, is obsession, ambivalence, and denial. So obsession sometimes get, gets defined in different ways, but the most common way I've heard it defined is it's something like, well, you structure your whole life around it, you structure your day around it, it displaces what ought to be larger and more important priorities in your life. Um, everything's kind of orbiting or ordered around it, obsession. Ambivalence means that you kind of experience this, I don't know, kind of sense of a divided self in which you're, you're strongly drawn to whatever the substance or process is and you, you want it. But there's also a part of you that kind of wants to hate it, that kind of hates it and wants to leave it behind forever. And so there's this sort of push-pull. You might think of, say, like uh, Gollum's relationship to the, to the ring in Lord of the Rings is maybe an example of that. You know, he wants it, he's got to have it, it's his precious, but he also kind of wants to be done with it. Um, or Smeagol does. That's part of the point, I guess. Gollum wants it and Smeagol does not, but they're the same person somehow. So... Um, okay, well, I guess the next question, then at least in the way that I, it made sense to me to structure this, has to do with, okay, so however we define it, what causes it? And I'm going to start approaching that by saying what I don't think causes it, um, what I don't think is the cause of addiction, um, or at least not the root causes of addiction. Um, so, well, and the list I'm about to rattle off here is, I think, 
there's a lot of ways that we still as a society and as individuals act out or act like we think that these are the causes of addiction. Um, so, so I'm saying something here that I, I don't know that it's a, a widely held view, although I have encountered it quite a bit in the literature, but okay, well, well, what are not the root causes of addiction? Um, I would say that, you know, hedonism or pursuit of pleasure, like, I don't think that's it, actually. Um, not to say that people don't like pleasure and that we're not dopaminergically, you know, kind of structured to pursue pleasure, but I don't think that, especially in terms of major addiction, it's just a desire for pleasure or that that's a sufficient way to examine what a person is seeking and whatever they're seeking through the addiction. I think they're, as you'll see in the next section, I think they're seeking things much deeper and more spiritual than mere pleasure. Another thing that I think is not the root cause of addiction is individual moral failing. Um, I don't really accept that thesis. Uh, so to become more clear as I go, I guess, but in the, in the there's lots of reasons I don't accept that thesis. One is that it's too individualistic. So it operates on this premise that there's like there's this something called an individual, and this individual apparently isn't nested in a wider relationship and set of networks in a community, that they're just kind of an individual unit, and they make something called moral decisions from some sort of kind of, I don't know, blank, unpositioned space. And um, when they fail to make good ones, then there are repercussions, and one of those repercussions can be addiction. Um, like to me, I'm not saying that there's not such a thing as individuals and <laughs> people don't make decisions, but to me, it's just it. Whatever is true about that account conceals more than it reveals, or something like that. I don't know. It just seems to me to not really work. And it also, also just, I mean, you know, there's a there's a position that was held for the larger part of the 20th century that has been defined by scholars as the moral model as an approach to thinking about addiction. That was basically this. And, but it went deeper. It didn't say, well, it's just individual moral failing. It also said, and this is my third on the list of where not the root causes of addiction. It's like, well, some people are more morally inferior um, or defective. And so, you know, in this view, like there's, Apparently, um, something like a um, jointly exhaustive, inversely valued, mutually exclusive dichotomy of persons where there's like the superior people and the inferior people, and these morally inferior ones make bad choices because they're morally inferior, and um, because of that, they end up going down an addictive road. And so, you know, Lawrence Cope was one of the pioneers of this view and of policy responses predicated on that view. You know, later in life realized that it was actually a really problematic way of thinking about it. And, you know, because one of the things of the many, I mean, in addition to just not thinking it's true, was that if that is the case, then the only thing you can really do with the morally inferior addict is separate them from the normal healthy people through incarceration or institutions. Um, so in other words, like threaten any degree of connectedness that they have in a wider network of relationships. Um, so I, I don't think that, that makes sense. Um, I don't think that's right or a root cause of addiction that there's, well, some people are just hedonistic and they want pleasure. Um, or they make poor moral choices or they do because they're morally inferior. Um, weak will, you hear that one, you know, crazia, dishonest and deceptive, selfish and antisocial, all just kind of seem ways of attributing addictive, addiction and addictive behavior to, to sort of in, innate moral flaws within the person. I, I call this uh, tautological badness. And it's something like, well, people are bad because they do bad things and do bad things because they're bad. And being bad is bad. And addiction is bad. And addictions are bad because they are addicts and they're addicts because they're bad. And it's just like, I just don't know if it really takes us anywhere. So I check that one also. Um, okay, so then that leads to, well, what, what do I think are some of the root causes of addiction? And, you know, in my own thinking, this list has changed several times. Where it's at now, the one that I, I don't know if these are rank ordered necessarily, but the way I thought about it as I kind of put it together. The, the first one I listed is, is wounds and trauma. 
Um, you know, so um, I think people have wounds that are in need of healing. They have traumatic experience and addiction is one of the ways that they're coping with those wounds and that trauma. And when I say trauma, I don't just mean necessarily uh, trauma that that person has directly experienced. I also mean intergenerational trauma. You know, so there's a, a, a growing literature on epigenetics and the ways in which things that have happened in our wider familial systems going back at least three generations can be passed down to us genetically and impact our fears, our actions, our anxieties, our level of cortisol production um, in ways that have a profound influence on our behavior and our ability to feel safe, our ability to feel like we belong. Um, you know, they did studies, for example, on the children of people in the Holocaust and found out that um, the level who themselves didn't directly experience the concentration camps, but they found out that the effects of the cortisol production in the brain was the same, um, had the same impact that it did on their ancestors. And so there's another one, I mean, that they did where, I mean, it seems to me, I know I'm not a scientist, but in terms of what I've read, that this is almost uncontroversial at this point. You know, they did studies on mice. They don't know how it's genetically transmitted, but that trauma is embodied and that it's somehow genetically transmitted seems, I mean, I know there's people who still argue with it, but there's a pretty broad consensus. They did studies in, with mice where they had, I think I'm getting this right, they had mice that um, they conditioned to be afraid of the scent of lavender. Um, so, you know, the classical conditioning kind of thing where they give an electric shock every time. I always get sad at the mean studies on mice because you know, they share 99% of our DNA, but they um, would give them a shock, lavender, until they got the conditioning to where they could just do the lavender and the mice would have a adverse reaction. Then they let the mice reproduce. Then they let the offspring of the mice grow into adulthood and the adult mice had the fear of the lavender. You know, So that's genetically passed in some way. Wow. <laughs> Or at least that's what that school thinks, you know, so and there seems to be mounting evidence that that's true. So I think that that intergenerational and lived trauma that um, we experience is um, a big part of it. You know, I'm, I'm at the point in my studies now that um, I almost think that it's essential to any approach to addiction and recovery to do a map. And the literature says going back at least three generations of the different stories that need to be told, uh, especially the traumatic ones. So that's one. I think that's one root cause of addiction, uh, intergenerational and lived trauma. Another, I think, is a desire, it's related, is a desire to erase traumatic memories, um, to erase trauma. So that's one approach, you know, um, with trauma is you know, try to erase it. And I, I thought of two examples that are kind of, um, I don't know, they're, they're not the most extreme examples, let's say, but maybe can help us think about it. So this was just accidental, but they happen to both be in Jim Carrey movies. I don't know why. If Jim Carrey is trying to tell us something. I don't know. But um, So the first one was Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I don't know if anyone's seen that. But the premise of that movie is that I think you know he's going through a breakup, so the severing of a romantic relationship that was a deep bond. And the premise, science fiction kind of premise, is that there's this company that can like, you, what, like selectively erase certain memories so it's, it's like it never happened or something like that. And so Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet, who were um, the couple, are kind of both independently doing this to try to just sort of erase the pain of, that, of the, the severing of that bond. And so um, I thought about that and thought like, well, you know, in real life, at least, at least at present, there's not um, a company that we can go to to erase our traumatic memories. There might be in like 20 years or something, you know, but there's not now, but there's other ways people try to erase those memories or hide those memories. And those can be through substances or processes, you know, or behaviors that are meant to kind of numb or escape or erase that which is too painful to narrate or address or allow oneself to experience. Um, so that was one. The other one that was just a quicker one is um, The Grinch, 
like I said, again, is it's accidental Jim Carrey reference, but there's just this quick scene in that movie where I forget exactly how it is, but he says something to his dog, Max, like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, time to deal with those pesky memories. And he puts his head in like, I don't know, just like this clapping monkey with symbols or something. Remember that? Yeah. And so trying to erase those pesky memories. And we find out later in that version that, you know, he has these childhood memories of like shame and feeling different and stuff that were, were part, part of part of that. So so I think those are those are big ones. Um, another root cause of addiction, I would say, is loneliness and isolation. Um, one of the technical terms in the literature for this is social dislocation theory, you know, disconnectedness. Um, anybody who studies addiction um, had a very strong feeling once the um, pandemic began that addiction was going to spike. And, and it did, you know. Um, and that's because human beings need to be connected in a network of relations, relationships, you know, like we're not meant to be isolated. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen, so moving from Jim Carrey, I don't, I don't know if anyone's seen the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway, where he ends up on the island and he's got to make friends with the volleyball and have conversations with it. You know, it's like we're, we're just kind of not meant to be island on an island of self, I guess. Um, so one study that they did on this that I don't know if you probably already heard of this, maybe, but it's real quickly. It's called Rat Park. And so they did the study again, the rats, but um, they were doing studies, and I want to say this is the early 60s, on morphine addiction and morphine dependence. And so they had a rat in a cage, and they had two of the water bottles, you know. One was regular, normal water, and the other was laced with morphine. They wanted to see what percentage of rats would become addicted to the morphine-laced one and, um, and you know, what they would do. And so some overwhelming percentage, like 97%, they drank both of them, then they continually went back to the morphine one, and they drank it, and they drank it, and they drank it until they overdosed. And so the thesis was like, okay, well, the, the addiction is in the substance. It's in the relation of the individual to the substance. Um, but then a, later, a Canadian researcher came along and said, like, well, I want to try something. Uh, well, let's say, because, you know, a rat in a cage by itself is not a natural environment for a rat. Um, so he created what he called rat park. And so Rat Park was, it was still a cage, but it was a much, much bigger one. And it had uh, abundance of food and drink, and it had other rats that could play together and have familial connections. And it was more like a natural rat environment. Um, and then the same thing with the water bottles, and a very small percentage um, got addicted to the morphine one. Um, the great majority, they tried both, and then they just kind of ignored the morphine one. And so... Um, as it turns out, social connectedness um, is uh, like a basic human need. You know, it's not a kind of luxury. And so, so I think that's the big one. Um, you know, so disconnectedness from others, disconnectedness from the self. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain this too deeply right now, but, you know, I think I was getting at this a little bit earlier with the intergenerational literature. Like, I, I think that behind addiction in one sense, you know, is a flawed individualistic anthropology that where we view ourselves as kind of isolated units or kind of John Locke. And I like a lot of stuff John Locke said, but not the tabula rasa blank slate thing. Like, I think that's wrong, maybe, you know, where we're just kind of these isolated units and we make decisions and of our intellectual, intellective will that shape our individual destinies. Like, it's, well, like we are individuals in some sense, but we're nested in communal structures we're nested in familial structures and understanding our story and who we are requires, it seems, understanding the stories that have come before us and the stories of our families. And, you know, in the literature I've been reading on intergenerational trauma, it says like you have to do that work of knowing and understanding those stories in order to turn ghosts into ancestors, you know, because ancestors can be even like the hard stories that because when you go back three generations there's gonna, there's just going to be stories of trauma so like the literature says that if you that i've been reading says that if you don't do that process then down the line trauma cascades and and people later down the line start start acting out of unconscious loyalties to forgotten stories of family members and so so yeah i think there's a kind of alienation um from 
not only from others in an individualistic society, but even in a sense from our from ourselves, from our own backgrounds. That was part of what Bell Hooks meant when she talked about dislocation, social dislocation. You know, it's not just dislocation in the sense of being physically isolated from another person. It's dislocation in the sense of being isolated or disconnected from your own culture, ancestry, stories, traditions, something like that. So wounds, trauma, loneliness, isolation, disconnectedness. Um, and then another one is is unmet spiritual needs. So we'll start getting to kind of some of the spiritual component. So I'm not going to go too far into this distinction, but, you know, a meal is a material need. Um, sharing a meal with a loved one is a spiritual need on some level. Um, I guess you could think about it that way. And so when I say unmet spiritual needs as part of the root causes of addiction, some of the ones I'm thinking about are an unmet desire to belong without having to be perfect. You know, um, so we kind of have this desire to be in authentic communities where we don't have to pretend to be something we're not uh, to be accepted and belong in those communities. Um, so an unmet desire to belong without having to be perfect. To belong amidst our incompleteness, something like that maybe. Another one is an unmet desire to be loved, understood, and cared for. You know, And so I have a little quote about that here. Um, um, so Father G. Simon Herrick, who used to be at the Center for Peacemaking, I, um, Chris, Chris Jeske gave me a, a copy of a, a manuscript he was writing on addiction, and he had this great quote in there where he's talking about it, and it's, he's actually quoting Richard Pryor, um, Richard Pryor live on the Sunset Strip, and uh, Pryor's talking about his addiction with crack cocaine, and Father Herrick says this is the best of best definition of addiction he's ever seen. So here's what Pryor says. Richard Pryor says, says um, people didn't understand me. And the cocaine pipe would say, come on in the room with me. I got you covered. I know how you feel, Rich. I understand. Just light me up, hold me for a couple of days, and we'll talk it over. My pipe would say, I understand, Rich. They don't know. It's your life. They don't have the right to mess with you. Where were they when you needed them? Come on in here with me because I love you. So, I don't know, I think you kind of see a lot of it in there, huh? Like trauma, um, wounds, desire for connection. I mean, a lot of the literature I read talks about addiction as a relationship, you know, to be a relationship with a person, with a substance, with a process, you know, but it's, a, it's an unhealthy relationship. Um, so, so unmet needs and those things, you know, belonging, having community, being loved, being understood, being cared for, like those aren't kind of like optional additions to, you know, optional luxuries in a human life. Like those are basic spiritual human needs. Like we don't, it's hard, we can't function without those. And, and when they're lacking, we'll reach out to something, you know, to fill those, those holes. So another one is an unmet yearning for meaning. You know, um, like we need we need to be able to experience meaning in the world, to experience a sense of, of purposefulness. You know, the opposite of this, at least in the spiritual tradition um, that I've studied most, was called acedia, which meant slow to sight, descent into a life no longer being lived. It gets translated now sloth or something like that, seven deadly sins. And then people think that's laziness. That's almost the opposite of what it meant. Like a person with a CDA could be very industrious. They could be working very hard. They could be doing a lot of, a lot of things. What's distinctive about a CDA is that they, they can't understand what's meaningful about their own life or why they're doing it or what the point of it is. And the best way I ever heard it described was somebody said, you know, it's, it was like their life was a snow globe and they were holding it and they were shaking it up and watching all the things moving around. But like they weren't in it. You know, they weren't living it. So it's this kind of alienation from self and one's own life again. They can both be kind of priming the brain and the self for addiction or result from addiction or is bound up with addiction in some way. Uh, unmet desire to be on a journey of self-discovery and growth. You know, um, when I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions so I won't go too far into it, but you know, I think this is right. It's something like um, the you know, our, the way our dopaminergic center functions, it's like, I think we're supposed to hang out somewhere between 40 and 60, I forget what they call it. You know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but 
nanograms per deciliter of dopamine or something like that. And it was like 40, 60, somewhere in there, like decent day, where to say, like the best day ever where all these awesome things happen, you know, and you can envision what that might be for you. I don't know. We wake up and Biden comes on. It's like, hey, pandemic's over. We found this new thing. It's gone. You know, that starts it. And then, it, then, then it's great all the way from there. And then at the end of the day, you're having your favorite meal with the person you love most or something. It's like, hey, that was great. And you're at like 90 maybe there, you know. And if you take an opioid, it's, you're at about 1,000. You know? So um, so what that's doing is mimicking, um, you know, mimicking a sense of, of being on a journey, of striving, of accomplishing something, of meaning. I have read one account where a patient had said, um, uh, when I took, the first time I took an opioid, I watched the Flintstones and it was full of meaning. It was the most amazing, awe-inspiring thing. And that wasn't because the Flintstones objectively is that, in my opinion, maybe some, you know, but it was because, you know, when your dopamine is heightened to that level and your brain is firing, you know, um, that's a way that's experienced. So unmet yearning for meaning resentment instead of gratitude. I just had to say something about that because everything I read, especially in any of the 12 steps literature, like resentment just comes up again and again and again as a kind of spiritual state that really disposes one towards persisting in, um, falling into and persisting in addictive behaviors. You know, resentment, which is a kind of turned inward, like right acknowledgement of sometimes right, like Richard Pryor, you know, there's resentment in it, but he's talking also about things he's really experienced. I don't know if any of you studied Pryor, but he had a very traumatic childhood. And, um, you know, so there, but there's something about it that's turned inward. And I had to juxtapose it there to gratitude because something that really helped me in reading about this was the idea, and this is not just with resentment, but any addiction, like it's, it's more helpful to say to somebody who's experiencing addiction, here's something you should start doing rather than you should stop doing that. You know, like we obviously focus, there's a truth in it, like, hey, stop drinking, stop taking, but like the way to stop, it seems, is, or at least to work towards stopping is to start doing something different. So with resentment, it's not like, well, sit in a room, wait for the resentful thoughts to come into your head and then will them out of your head. It's like, hey, have fun with that, you know? So a lot of the things I've been reading are intentional practices of gratitude. You know, there's all kinds of meditative practices of gratitude. I've been, if anyone's interested, email me. I'll send you some of them. But Pure Land Buddhism has quite a few that I've found really helpful. But like trying to cultivate gratitude is something you can do, whereas I'm not sure if it's just trying to like evade the resentful thoughts um, is, is the best approach. Um, so we're still on root causes of addiction, and I have to add this, you know, corrupt social practices, you know, so corrupt um, corporations that intentionally and deliberately create products that hij hijack our dopaminergic systems and mimic meaningful responses to our spiritual needs. Like, that's a cause of addiction, in my view. Scapegoating and stigma. So policies and media that associate addiction with marginalized social groups and claim to be able to solve the problem by punishing those groups out of existence. This is kind of a group version of the moral model. It's like, this is because people are bad and we can punish the bad stuff that's out there and make it go away. It's like, not true, I don't think. Um, okay, so those are what I have as the root causes. And then the next question is, well, is addiction, so this is, I'm getting more to my thesis, is addiction better understood as an individual moral failing or spiritual and communal disease? Based on all the things I've kind of just read, here's what I, where I'm at with that as of right now. Is it, well, if you create a society of atomized individuals disconnected from their ancestral roots, from each other, from themselves, from nature, from their own bodies, and from any sense of awe-evoking transcendence, then you're creating a culture of addiction. If you create a society in which profit motive is given free reign to intentionally produce addictive products designed to hijack our dopaminergic systems, thereby mimicking responses to our deepest needs as human beings, then there will be addiction epidemics. If you create a society in which you pretend that the right amount of punishment visited upon the most vulnerable can fix the problem, then you're cultivating precisely that degree and kind of communal denial in which addiction takes hold. Um, so, so for those reasons, that puts me in the spiritual and communal disease category in terms of what I think is a better way of thinking about it. With that being said, then that gets us back to the thesis, well, okay, if addiction is a communal and spiritual disease, does that mean that it makes sense to adopt the view that King and May do, Timothy McMahon King, Gerald May, and others? 
that everyone is an addict. And well, I don't think so, but here's why they do. King and May think it's a good idea for two, two reasons. First, they just think it's true. Like they, they think it's true that everyone is an addict. Um, but the reason they think that is because they expand the definition of addiction so that it, it can it include like almost any unhealthy attachment to any possible thing. Um, and then they also posit gradations like all the way down to the bottom. So even that having the potential to be addicted to something is a way of being addicted. And to me, which is also a way of expanding the definition. And so to me, that degree of expansion is, is kind of a problem. It's like, well, yeah, if you expand it to include everything, then everyone is an addict. They also think it's more helpful since it erases the addict, non-addict binary, where it's like, well, there's people that have addictions and there's people that don't, and we're the good ones that don't, and they're the bad ones that do, um, which I, I understand that move. And I, think, I, think, I guess I think there's a better way of making that move. Um, and I understand what they're doing. They're saying that that binary separates and thus moves us away from a communal approach. And so, so I do think you need to contend with that binary, but I, not in the way that they do. So the reason I disagree is, well, just because I, of that expansion, I think it's, you know, Taylor's moderate caffeine addiction is radically distinct from something like major opioid addiction, in my view. And there's something about equating those or putting them on the same scale that, that to me is... Um, well, just kind of like disingenuous. It's just not like these are fundamentally different kind of things and need to be approached differently. And there's something about those lines that I think are important, especially those for experiencing the most like life threatening addictions. You know, addictions come with mortality rates. So I, I think there's something in that move of just kind of classifying everything as the gradation of the same kind of thing that blurs lines that I think are help that, that kind of need to be there on some level to distinguish people who are in real danger from people who are in a, just a fundamentally different situation, you know? Um, so that's one, um, or, well, I guess that's the main reason. Now, so then my thesis is that um, I would argue that it's more plausible to posit that everyone is involved in addiction in some way. So this could be a person experiencing addiction at different times in life, different stages, because that's the other thing with the everyone's an addict thing, it's like just, when all the time, you know, it's, are there like times in a person's life where they're bound up with something, times where they're going through recovery? So, um, so this could be a person experiencing addiction at different times in life. It could be a concerned family member, and this is so involved with addiction. It could be a concerned family member struggling with codependency. Um, this could be in the very networks of communal and ancestral relations that foster patterns of thought and interactions that either are addictive or prime the brain for addiction. Well, in that sense, I disagree with King, Timothy McMahon King, when he says that the question is not, am I an addict, but how much and to what? In my view, that a person does not believe themselves to be suffering an addiction at a particular time in life is not in and of itself evidence of denial. I think, am I an addict can be an honest question and a good one to honestly ask. I do, however, think that the question in what ways am I involved with addiction, either through relationships with other, with the other or the history of my family or the community in which I live is a question for everyone. And this seems to me essential to learning how best to respond to those patterns or interaction in one's life, family, and community. And so I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. I don't know how it works. So. Paul. Yes, I guess would be the answer. I mean, yes to both, I guess, you know, I mean, I think, no, 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 it's okay. I just, I think that there can be a, there can be a, just a religious version of the moral model. It seems to me that this basically adds something like, yes, you're bad. 
and um, that's why you're addicted. And oh, by the way, God doesn't like you. It's like, oh, well, great, you know. And when you're doing that, it's like you're confirming a person's worst perceptions about themselves. You're causing shame and low self-efficacy, and so it's not helpful. And so I do think that there's there there have been religious versions of that, quite frankly, that that aren't helpful, not just within Christianity, but within you know, different religions. In the studies I've done, I've studied approaches, certainly within the Christian tradition, but also Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, and it seems to me that there, there does emerge something like that, you know, um, but there's also seems to be alongside it an a, a approach that draws from what I would call the better parts of the traditions, which is the idea that there's, there's, there's something in the universe that's infinitely compassionate and is compassionate enough to hold you in your incompleteness, you know, and that um, is is calling you forth to something more. And that there's something that that you can appeal to that allows you to kind of move out of the space where you feel like you have to use your own power to conquer something, which is actually a part of the addictive cycle itself, you know, um, and and kind of hand something over to something outside yourself. You know, it's kind of like that with the resentment gratitude, like resentment's inward, gratitude's outward. So something outward to which to turn and something that's compassionate um, and that can, can give you a space in which you can be powerless, but not helpless. You know, so I do think that there's, there's something like that, that, that is deeply powerful, not only within the Christian tradition, but in what I've studied in Judaism and Islam and Buddhism. So I'd say, yeah, kind of depend on who's 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 saying what at what given time, something like that. Thanks for your question. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the things that I've studied, I mean, obviously, like, there's no, like, well, I guess the, the most basic answer is we can't, like, we can't just move them out of it, you know, like, if they don't, if they don't want to do that, and don't want to be helped, like, you can't, you can't make that happen from the outside, at least that's what, what I continue to encounter. Um, there's a lot about what's not helpful. So what's not so you can try to do things that don't make it worse. That's one thing, which is like shaming, blaming, basically enacting in a moral model, even if you don't explicitly say it, but something like, you know, why are you the way that you are? Why are you like this? That sort of thing, you know. And then it's kind of tailored to individual situations, I think. Like sometimes maybe it's more compassionate withdrawal from somebody and not enabling, you know, um, those kind of things. In terms of um I have this, just one other thing I'd mentioned that, I, so I don't think the distinction is like, how do you get this person out of it? But like, what, what seems to be helpful and not helpful, you know, something like that. So something I found helpful in my studies about this is what Hannah Picard calls a responsibility without blame model. So I think that's really significant because, because when you sit, when you get rid of the moral model, you don't want to throw out with that, the sense of telling a person like, and this, I think this has to do with hope, too. Like, there's things that you can do that might make things a little bit better. Sometimes it's called a harm reduction model, you know, but it's like, it's not like, hey, sobriety tomorrow, you failed. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to fail, you know. But it's like, well, where are some things you can do today that might make things a little bit better? Like, hey, and, and just breaking that down to the smallest practical thing a person can do. Like, maybe you can do one practice of gratitude today. Maybe you can write down one thing you're grateful for, despite all this stuff that's happening, you know. Maybe it's two tomorrow. Maybe you can cut back a little bit. Maybe you can move, you know. Um, and so what that's doing is giving a person some responsibility in, within their own recovery, while at the same time, time trying to avoid that thing that sometimes is attached to responsibility that's, that's really, it's more about blame. It's, it's like your fault. It's your fault that it's this way. And that does the opposite of empowering that responsibility because it's just like, it just disintegrates a person's sense of their own ability to do anything, you know? So I don't know if that gets at it. That's the kind of best I got, though. 
oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be comprehensive? That's just what I've studied. Yeah. Oh, no, of course. Yeah. Social supports, therapy, learned behaviors, meditative and prayerful practices that like restore communication between the automatic and conscious self. Of course. Yeah. I didn't mean to leave those out, but. Oh, yes. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with that. And that's why I don't, well, I think I agree with him on this. Like King argues, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that show Intervention, where I think it's still on, but it's basically, it's like a confrontational therapy approach that says something like an ultimatum, like if you don't stop doing this, you're going to lose your connect, all of your connections. And so King says like, you know, the, the connectedness that a person have has is their best hope. So you need to have boundaries and you need to have you know, all of that. But threatening whatever level of connectedness a person has is not the way to help them get past it. Yeah, to your point. Mm -hmm. Teresa. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good one. Like, I hope so, I guess would be my answer. Like, I want to believe that. And I also do think there's some gradations of recovery, but I also think that addictions cluster, you know, so I don't like there's some that get the most focus, maybe understandably because of like, health risk or threats or those kind of things or they're just taking up the most tension, you know, but if you don't, if you do go with that kind of broader conceptualization of with May of you know, kind of like unhealthy attachments or patterns, you know, I don't know. Um, it seems to me like the state of getting to a place where you're entirely free of unhealthy attachments and your true desires for kind of unbridled to operate in a healthy way. I mean, I mean, that would be quite a high place to get to, you know, so I like the hope, but I think I, I would, one thing I definitely agree with in some of like the AA literature and that kind of thing, and the focus on continence over temperance, you know, so is, um, I think the thing I absolutely think is true is that if you say to a person experiencing addiction that the goal is to be entirely free of even the desire for it, that ideal can seem so distant as to be punishing, you know? And so it seems to me like any ideal of like perfection or kind of getting to this entirely, you know, completely restored place, or I don't know what the right word would be, can be an obstacle um, and that better is something like a, a rigorous commitment to progress, you know, something like that. Kind of what I was saying earlier, like, hey, how do we get a little bit better, you know? Because I do think, I don't know, there's, especially for persons, like I said, experiencing major addiction, like if you put before them this ideal of perfect sobriety, it's like, okay, well, I'm so far away that, I, you know, that's my thoughts on it, but. Oh, sorry. The first one? Oh, I, sorry on the first one. I don't know if I can. Um, oh, yeah. Are you talking about this one? Yeah, I don't. I mean, yeah, there's definitely research on epigenetics that speaks to um, the past. I mean, I think that there's genetic predispositions to alcoholism and certain other addictions is pretty much undisputed at this point. Um, what I've seen that's debated in the literature is the nature of those genetic pathways. Um, so there's a question about the extent to which, which genetic pathways to addiction are influenced by, um, one's own behavior and choices. So they're not, they're not single pathways, but multiple pathways, something like that. Like I said, I'm not a scientist, but the be I guess the best way I could put it is that to think of of addiction as an inherited disease certainly makes sense in that literature, but the debate is around the extent to which it's a disease like, I don't know, say diabetes or something like that, where lifestyle choices have a profound influence on the way that the disease expresses and unfolds versus a disease that's more kind of, I don't know, like sickle cell anemia and almost determined in a sense.
Yep. Oh, yep. Sorry. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. I, mean, I know I've heard a lot about major spikes in opioids and alcohol. Um, and I know there was even at one point during the pandemic, there was a debate about how best to handle that when people couldn't get, um, say, like alcohol, for example, because they couldn't go out to stores and what would happen with those withdrawals and that kind of thing. So I think those were definitely big ones. I mean, one thing we didn't broach today was the topic of like technological addictions and social media and ways that those become become addictive um, or can become problematic. And so I would suspect that there was probably quite a rise in that kind of thing. Um, but then that also raises a question that unfortunately we probably don't have the time to go into right now, but we could chat about sometime if you want about, and I'm not sure about that one when I was talking about that belonging idea. Like there's some people who say like, look, social media is just a counterfeit space for doing that. And you should just like not engage in that. But there's other people that I've read that say like, well, no, it can be like, it doesn't have to be just a counterfeit space. It can be better than a lot of alternatives. It can be a kind of communal community. And so there's a kind of debate about that there. Although both agree that there can certainly be ways of interacting with social media that become really problematic in an addictive sense. So and I would think that probably would have been something, but I don't I haven't seen data on that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think so. I mean, I think it's one of them. I think the, I guess the more, the way I would say it is that like a person who's struggling to belong and isolated is certainly um, very vulnerable. That's a place where addiction, it's very vulnerable to addiction taking hold. And that one of the things they can be seeking through the addictive practice is a sense of belonging or safety or security, which is very distinct from a view that says, oh, they just want pleasure, you know, yeah, it can be that. Yeah. You know, or it can just be like Pryor was saying, you know, like they feel a sense of companionship with when they participate in this behavior, you know, so. Good question. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.